Um, I'm really happy to have uh, Kiichi Matsuda joining me today. Uh, hello, Kiichi. Hi. Hey, thanks for having time to actually join us. Thanks for having um, me. Maybe you could just introduce yourself a little bit. I know that you're running a studio where you drew a lot of this stuff with augmented reality and so on. Uh, maybe you could just give us some insight into the projects that mm -hmm. you're working on. Yeah, so I'm a designer and filmmaker, um, but my background is actually in architecture. So I work across quite a lot of different types of project, from kind of design consulting uh, in emerging technology applications to um, film commissions, which are kind of more fiction based, uh, to working on my own kind of self-initiated art projects or some, some commission art projects as well. Right. So it goes across kind of uh, film, concept design, and some kind of installation work as well. Right, right. Um, and in your work, it's mostly, or not mostly, but um, it's also about augmented reality and how we can actually uh, make sure that the interfaces we're creating can make use of the space in which they are used. Right. Mm, I mean, so I, I found, sorry, was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go, go. I, I found uh, augmented reality to be a really interesting way of being able to explain ideas around digital culture to an audience. Uh, if you look at kind of film and TV, obviously we spend a lot of time on our computers, right? Um, but it's very difficult to show that in media because it's so boring to watch somebody on a screen, like an actor, just scrolling through their phone. So in a way, like breaking the, the media out of the device and bringing it into the world and having the person interacting with that information in a way that we do with devices anyway right. is, a, is a very uh, kind of elegant metaphor for talking about how we interact right. with technology today. Right. So people think my films are about augmented reality, but they're not really. You know, they're about technology, they're about uh, sociology, about politics and economics right. and all these different things, right? So uh, one of the last uh, movies, I think you can say, you created, uh, it was the one actually highlighting what the society might, or the personal persons you could look like when we have all this immersive technology around us, right? right. And I'm just going to paste the link in a second, uh, but. I'm, it kind of brings me closer to this entire thing of you know, Black Mirror. Should we be afraid of technology? Uh, sh what, the what are the responsibilities we have as designers when using those powerful technologies like AR, VR, and whatever they're called? Uh, what should we be doing? Or is it just a technology, it's neutral, so we should do whatever we please? Um, should we be afraid of technology? I mean, yes, I guess. Uh, in the same way that we should be afraid of politics and you know, economics and inequality and all these different things that can affect us. Um, technology, as you said, is a tool, uh, but that's not a neutral thing, right? People will try to use it in different ways, um, and it's kind of, I think, up to us to be able to, to direct that um, as designers. Um, I mentioned I came from an architectural background. Right. Um, one of the interesting things about architecture is that you're designing for a client, but really you're designing for everybody who's ever going to use that building or that space. So it's kind of a little bit different in a way that you, you, you're not necessarily looking to uh, just fulfill all the client's demand, but you're actually trying to create a positive impact on the society as well. And I think that, that thinking really needs to carry over into other areas of design as well. So we shouldn't work on projects if we are not comfortable that they're contributing something good to the right. world. We should be uh, ethically engaged with these things and we should really try to think of design more like a responsible profession where we are collectively, through events like this, uh, talking to each other, talking about what kind of change you want to happen, what we can do as a profession to be right. able to help the world. I think this is critical at this moment. Yeah, because at this point there are so many things happening in the world entirely, so we as designers sure. actually have the potential and have the tools mm. as makers mm. right, to really move them in specific direction, in the direction that we want the future to be, because we are shaping the future in a way. Right, right. I mean, I've always seen um, technology as this kind of uh, uh, unstoppable force. It's just like a vector, like, like this, you know? And to say that you're against technology or you're for technology is a ridiculous idea because technology is just advancing, right? And it advances at different speed, but it seems to be advancing quicker and quicker. Uh, the problem is then that, that culture doesn't always advance in the same way. You know, like we sometimes fall back on ourselves. Sometimes things get too complicated and we retreat back into some different kind of mode of thinking. Sometimes uh, we get like effects that cause massive inequality. You know, we look at a lot of the, the problems that are happening now in the world and we see them as, as social or political problems. But a lot of these are technologically motivated. The, the rising uh, and, and frankly kind of insane amounts of inequality at the moment are a di direct result of, uh, of, of years and years of, of automation and de-skilling in jobs. And and we haven't responded to it. We've just seen technology as like, where's the next shiny new yeah, iPhone? I, I think it's also because we tend to, as designers, we tend to think that, okay, we have a pro our client has a problem, so we're going to design, like in this specific frame, we're going to design a specific solution for this specific problem outside, kind of outside of the scope 
that exists around this problem, right? Um, because we're creating those interfaces to solve you know, the client's problem. This is what we tend to do, as interface designers at least. But do you feel that as designers today, we are kind of moving from this space where we just design interfaces towards experiences which don't even have interfaces, like conversational interfaces, audio, in, uh, voice-based interfaces, and so on. It really changes a lot about how we're designing, right? Why would you say they don't have an interface? Well, no, I mean, not the visual like screen interface. This is what I mean. Oh, OK. Right? Yeah. So at this point, I think it's really interesting to see how we as designers should reinvent the the, you know, the, how we dis approach design, maybe. Mm. So because designing for a screen is one thing, designing for voice or for gestures or you know, even with augmented reality in mind, it's very, very different. Mm. So when you're working on a project, what would be a strategic, a good approach to say, I want to design an experience that's going to work here and here and here. Would it take four different designs, or can it be just one? It's a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, I think a lot of uh, web and mobile design has become this kind of entrenched method of doing things, and there's, there's um, uh, kind of taste, which is spread across, you know, by like you know Google's material design or all these different things, yeah, which exactly. become big trends, and people can say this is good, this is bad. In a way, that's actually limited uh, a lot of designers' ability to be able to think in other ways. And I think uh, this kind of uh, uh, kind of boxing in of design of like making everything flat and all these different things yeah. is actually um, kind of in a way sort of killing people's imagination. Um, I've worked with designers doing uh, uh, kind of concepts for augmented or like spatial interfaces, and we get time and time again, you know, the box with the menu, you know, the tree branching structure, these kind of uh, ideas which have really no place in a, a kind of spatial interface world. There's no reason for it, you know? Uh, we're just trying to kind of go from one thing to the next thing. And there, is a, there is a point in that as well, you know? But um, I, I guess one interesting thing I've been thinking about is uh, about kind of skeuomorphism. Yes. And this idea of, um, you know, wanting to kind of get away from that is a very unfashionable thing to do. But in VR space and AR space, it's actually really, really useful because it, we can use it as a tool to be able to give right. people this kind of intuitive sense of how to use something, you know, because you're, you're making a metaphor or something familiar. All right, that's, that's uh, really interesting. So when, when it starts to kind of working on a project, on a new project, what is your approach? So would you just start with, you know, a piece of paper and then you start thinking? Because again, if you tend to go and look around what other people are doing, we kind of maybe tend to use the same techniques or approach, or maybe use the same you know, patterns appearing every yeah. now and again. Um, but it kind of really, as you said, kind of blocks us from doing something entirely different. But at the same time... It depends, time, you know, do you want to make something that, it, that is a kind of version of something that someone else has made? Like, if you have a brief, do you want to say, like, okay, they did the right thing, let's try and copy them? Or do you want to look at the problem? Do you want to try and understand the best way to do it today, with today's technology, with today's people, with today's thinking, with today's culture? You know, this is what we should be doing as designers. Um, the, probably one of the worst things you can do is, like, research around, you know, yeah. what and people then, are doing. And, and then just pick and share. Like, right, right, right. We know, should be fancy outside. buttons here and fancy tables there. Exactly. Yeah. Right. We should be looking outside of these things, trying to involve, I think, like, arts and culture is a fantastic inspiration because you have so many talented people working in different areas who have very different and unique approaches to things. And if you just look at what's around, you can start to, to build things very quickly. Yeah, I think... Yeah. So I was gonna. You asked me about my approach. So I was yes. just gonna say that you know generally I I just have this like notebooks and notebooks and like I just write notes and I type notes the whole time. Sometimes those things come into an idea. Sometimes not. Uh, if it's a commission I'm working on, I'll generally try to find someone who's a good thinker within that organization and just talk to them for a long time, develop workshops, um, these kind of things. I'm working at the moment on a project for a film project for. Um, uh, a company related to accounting, which might not seem like the most uh, glamorous Exciting. thing to do, yeah. but actually it's incredible. And it's opened me up to a whole new world of, of different conversations, um, specifically this time surrounding uh, uh, autonomous corporations. And I'm very interested in the emergence of a kind of hard AI through uh, like a capitalist structure. Wow. Anyway, it, 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 you, you can find interesting things. That sounds in really exciting. I also know some designers who actually go ahead and start defining the signature first. Signature being that one thing that should be defining the entire experience. And it's not like, uh, it could be a style, like a theme of the design. It could be something like a little touch animations or transitions, and they would use them everywhere. And this is going to be the defining signature that they're going to use. Um, that's yes. like a branding thing, right? Uh, well, for branding, yes. Yeah, I don't yes. think that's design. Maybe it's a kind of design, but design is much bigger than that. You know, right. design is thinking about 
about the whole process of, of how a human being engages with, you know, whatever it is, right? A product, a service, an idea. And if we start talking about what color is it or, or like, you yeah. know, what little thing does it, like, who cares, right? Like, the point is about how you're interacting with the system, how you're understanding it, and how you conceptualize it in your own mind. Okay. Um, I have a question from Anna uh, saying, well, you can't stop technology from advancing, but you can or should you put some limitations on what technology we make available? Or should we put some limitations on what technology should be able to do? I mean, we do to some extent already, right? Like, you can't just uh, make a nuclear weapon or this kind of thing, right? Like, there, there are... Should we do the same with, you know, with our design tools or design technologies? Like I think, you know, legislation is definitely a very important part of any development in any area, right? Like, if we have uh, unopposed, uh, non-regulated economic markets, it causes absolute chaos um, and a lot of hardship and suffering for a lot of people. Regulation allows us to be able to harness the power of markets, but apply them, ideally, in a way that can actually serve everybody and, and provide growth for everybody. Technology, the same way. You know, we need to be careful about how we adopt these things. Artificial intelligence, automation could give us this world where, you know, everybody gets everything for free and it'd be fantastic. You can have, you know, like free vegetables delivered to your house every week and yeah. that could just be a service that we could provide to everybody easily. Yes. But we don't, you know, we, we decide that we're going to have to have like increasingly like hard lives to people and uh, that's just how we've done it. But that's not the technology's fault, right. it's us. Right. Right. as human beings, even to some extent as designers, that we've conceptualized this is the way the world works. So, you know, tough luck. But actually, you know, we have the power to be able to reframe those ideas, to present new ideas and, and, and show them to people in a way that they can understand. That's the power of design. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and also, there is an interesting new kind of, not new, but relatively new tendency, where we see many websites moving away from being websites towards existing on platforms like Facebook or Medium. Where there is, for example, if you go and look for a restaurant website, uh, quite often you will not find the restaurant website anymore because why should they exist on, you know, why should they have their own experience? Mm. You can just, you know, embed yourself in Facebook and that's it, people will find you. Mm. Um, do you think that it's really critical for, let's say, for a company that wants to establish themselves in any field, be it, you know, restaurant, be it fashion industry, whatever, should they have their own experience or should they go where people are? Facebook. You mean their own, like, website yes. experience? Uh, I don't know, I think like, you know, if you're a restaurant, your experience is sitting in that restaurant and eating the food. Like, that's their experience, and anything else is marketing, right? So, like, having a, a particular, and then you can just look at eff efficacy in that area, right? Like, say, you know, do we have, are we reaching more people, are we, you know, you can look at the numbers, it becomes quite a, a kind of, you know, accounting game. <laughs> right, right. So, I don't know, I think it just depends. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that a restaurant would need to have a website, but, you know, maybe there are, like points of interest, like points of contact. Like, for example, um, I've been using, I'm a big fan of the um, gov.uk website, which I think is a fantastic design project that's like miles ahead of any other countries. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Australia is picking up, they're working on something. Oh, uh, yeah? And the okay. US I'm a little out of touch in that area, but I really like the way they've approached it. And I think um, it makes a lot of sense for that, that part of government in terms of how we deal with it to be moved onto that online space. So the experience there is not sitting in a restaurant eating, it's about getting information, you know, and that's a time when it can be really useful to have your own kind of structure. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Denise. How was the process to create the hyper-reality? And how did you get to the term critical design? Well, critical design is an easy one. It's a term I kind of borrowed off um, uh, uh, Dunn and Raby, who are a, a design practice, um, but were teaching for a long time at the uh, RCA, the Royal College of Art in Design You probably need also to provide the context because not everybody saw hyper-reality. So I'm, I'm just going yeah, to okay. think in a second. Watch so. hyper-reality. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's like a demo or not, um, your view of what the... So the point of critical design is a lot of people think that design is just about solving problems. You know, like, let's, here's a problem, let's try and find a nice way to solve it that's cheap and beautiful or whatever, right? But um, critical design has a different approach that it uses design as a way of asking questions, posing questions, you know? So hopefully when people are watching Hyperreality, they're not just thinking, oh, I like the way he did that UI, or that doesn't, that seems like it wouldn't work very well. But they're thinking about other things, right? Like, they're, they're, they're being like questions being raised there. So that's where kind of critical design comes from. And again, like my process then is, is all around that kind of idea, you know, like how can we address uh, the issues that we're facing in society today, which are, you know, very plain to see, you can read it in the newspaper. How can we use 
design and our particular talents to be able to, to address those things. All right. Um, and then the last question, just to wrap up. I'm, I'm really curious about this one. Um, what are you most excited about these days? And what are the things you desperately want to master in 2017? Um, I've become... I, have, I, have, I don't know if excited is the right word, but I've started to feel like we, everybody needs to take a lot more responsibility for the world they live in. I used to blame things on my parents' generation, or even you know, generations before then, uh, but now, like, I don't know how old you are, but I'm like 32, and I can't We're blame my age. parents anymore. You know, it's, it's us now, and this transition over the next you know, 10, 20 years, uh, with the destruction of jobs, with rising inequality, is going to be incredibly challenging. And our actions now will define, essentially, what the world's going to look like for you know, children and you know, future generations. So I feel like um, the thing that I want to do in 2017 is start to try and understand, really, like, how do you make a stand? How do you take responsibility? All right, excellent. So I hope we're going to get this issue solved. Yeah. It's going to be a long journey for all of us. Of course, it's ongoing. So thank you so much for joining me today. Cheers, man. Nice excellent. To talk to you.